Ladies and gamers, my name is Bel Noir, and you are watching Cast My Game episode 6. So, uh, welcome everybody tuning in. This is uh, the sixth installment. It is Tuesday today, and uh, I'm feeling pretty good. I'm feeling pretty good for one reason and one reason only because today at work I was um, substituting one of my colleagues because he called in sick so I got called in to uh, uh, replace his lessons so I was supposed to teach five students today but only one of them showed up and it was the one that came it was it was the last lesson of the day uh, I probably scared them a little bit because I substituted the week previous as well and I found out that those people are not practicing and basically their technique is underdeveloped etc 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 and so I wanted them to improve upon that and I said that it may happen that I'll be substituting as well the next week so probably they all got scared. Oh my god, I, I, I suddenly need to do work for guitar? What? I never did that. So they didn't show up. Which left me with uh, approximately three hours of free time to spare. So what I did was I picked up my guitar and uh, since I had... Um, I still have a couple of my old uh, sheet music in my... Uh, guitar case. I picked some of those up and started practicing. I practiced three hours non-stop uh, practicing really hard you know like warming up doing scales and all that and then moving in eventually eventually moving on to the to the pieces and I managed to refresh and actually improve upon a piece I've been playing uh, or I have played um, five years ago it's called Danza Brasileira it's a uh, very fast piece by Jorge Morel and uh, I was pretty satisfied with myself because I got to uh, approximately 180 BPM so that's only 20 BPM away from where I want the piece to sound at so but but already it sounds pretty pretty hot and you can actually dance to it so I'm I'm f I'm feeling really awesome today. Uh, really good about myself that I have accomplished that. Um, so, back to back to the show. Um, uh, oh yeah, guys! If you would like me to make a recording of the piece and put it on my YouTube, let me know. If you are a fan of classical guitar or just a fan of guitar or acoustic, you know, music in general. Let me know if you want me to upload a short clip of me trying to trying to play this piece. It will still be horrible compared to like professional musicians because I haven't played for five years. But yeah, um, if you if you want me to try that, uh, let me know and I will do my best to try to record uh, a uh, quality piece of music for you. Back to the show. Um, so. Just to recap for the guys tuning in for the first time, this is a show uh, where I, a wannabe caster, uh, cast your replays that you sent me. So if you have a master versus master 1v1 replay that is approximately 20 minutes long, send it to me to bonoir at sesnam.cz, the email address you see below my camera window. And uh, if it makes the cut, if it's good enough, um, you know, if it's better than all the others, I will pick it up and I'll do a blind cast on the show live with uh, VODs being uh, available on my YouTube channel. After this cast actually I'll be probably I will be publishing the the uh, VOD from the previous uh, show so you can find that there as well. Um, yeah and uh, usually it is four games we have four games uh, today as well and we will start off with a PvP. Um, as I respond to a couple of questions here. Uh, C 
So, PvP going into the game. It's a fairly short game, judging by the but judging by the time. But uh should still be good. Should. I'm not saying it will, because I don't know. I'm saying it should. So <laughs> if it's not, uh don't bash on me please. Alright, so spawning in uh, the bottom right on Bill Shear Vestige, we do have Emperor, I think I'm not sure, but I think he was the one submitting this replay via Battle.net forums. So we have the red Protoss Emperor and uh, blue Protoss uh, White Ski in the top left. As I forgot to enable my music yet again. Okay, so PvP pretty pretty straightforward. Pretty much uh, what you do is um, uh, you want to be safe versus Oracles and DTs. Uh, and uh, if it's that, I if you manage to be safe versus both of those uh, eventualities, then you pretty much can transition into a macro game. Or what you can do is uh, you can do all sorts of pushes out of uh, one base. You can go for a uh, three gate pressure. You can go for a three gate stargate. You can go for a proxy stargate. You can go for uh, for very early DT expansions with uh, two gates. You can you can do sentry expands actually with two gates. Uh, and be quite uh, quite well off doing that. So uh, so far we see a uh, pretty standard opening. Both players currently boosting their next side, getting gateways on 13 and scouting their bases. We see Whitesky scouting everywhere inside his base for uh, a possible proxy cannonage that might be or might not be uh, executed by his opponent. And uh, you know after Whitesky scouted. Actually, he has not scouted proxy locations at all. He just went straight to his opponent's base saying, well, you know what, if I'm gonna get cannon rushed, I don't care. I don't care, I'm good enough to hold it. And uh, he's continuing with a double gas on 15 and we'll be getting a core straight afterwards. It's very well timed, I have to say. Skipping one probe to get it on time, but uh, but that's all right, that's all right. Uh, getting your core right on time where uh, it should be going down is uh, more important actually in PvP than uh, getting your uh, uh, probes because you can always kernel boost later on and uh, it looks like uh, by the looks of it Whitesky might be, yeah he is getting a second gateway here because he's got only two probes on the assimilator, two probes on each probably should be putting after, after he gets the first stalker he should be putting additional probes onto those gases so that he is on six total so we shall see if he ends up doing that. Meanwhile, his opponent is opening up very, very standard. He's uh, he's gotten a second gas after the gateway, and then he's going to produce a stalker. And uh, well, uh, getting a second gate as well. So you know this gate is delayed by quite a lot. So so far, I'm reading this as uh, Emperor has his build refined a little bit better than his opponent because his second gate finishes just when the stalker ends up popping out and uh, if this pylon would have been in the main base uh, that would have been on time as well and he could go and uh, chrono boost both of these stalkers so far he's only chrono boosting one because that one is behind and he wants to have three stalkers as soon as possible mothership core coming out for Vitsky he's getting an additional gateway as well and getting a zealot out of all things that is really uncommon usually you get a zealot first and then you follow up with a stalker you don't do it the other way around so as I said before I think Emperor has his build a little bit more refined and uh, well yeah um, we actually see a Stargate going down for Vitsky, so uh, probably an Oracle opening. And judging by the number of gates, he uh, if he ends up not producing out of those, it's probably because he wants to be safe against any kind of pressure that his opponent might be throwing at him. We have two proxy pylons here for Emperor, and he is moving out across the map. The uh, first proxy pylon is going to be scouted by... Uh, Vaisky, so he is probably going to send some units over there. Now if you notice the timer, it's it's behind or over six minutes, so you have to be really careful when you're doing this because warp gate most probably is already finished and the units can stop warping in and it happened! Three stalkers being warped in directly at the pylon, catching up uh, and rendezvousing with the uh, additional three stalkers and uh, all of Vaisky's army goes down. His gateway was 
delayed by quite a bit, I have to say, 40 second delay on a gateway, that is just too much. Two Zealots being warped in, but it's not going to be enough. He all Oh, this is a really nice respawn, getting a Twilight Council down. He just has to make sure he mines enough gas so that he can get DTs. I don't think this will be the case, though. He's got one cannon here, and uh, has that Stargate actually... Yeah, it did produce uh, an Oracle. That Oracle is going to go into the main base of his opponent, but uh, he will lose his main base uh, very, very quickly here. He should... Oh, he should be really mining gas. If he, if he can get a Dark Shrine... Maybe he will be able to warp in some DTs, but no, I don't. No, actually, I don't think he will because those pylons will go down. That will supply block him, and he will. He won't be able to uh, warp in any units. Meanwhile, the Oracle is gathering up kills in the enemy's mineral line already up to nine and ten. Nine. Okay, nine kills, ten kills, maybe, maybe. Okay, ten kills before the probes have been pulled away. Uh, Emperor, this is his whole army. He's killing probes. And uh, he's pretty much uh, destroying everything in the main base of his opponent. Uh, so these are, these will be the last buildings left standing after all of this is killed. Meanwhile, two stalkers have been warped in in Emperor's base, warding off that Oracle who has gotten himself up to 16 kills, bringing the probe count down to 6 versus 7. And uh, it is continuing to rapidly drop for Whiteski and... Uh, uh, Whiteski not being able, not having any economy, not being able to mine, GG's out of the game, or Rage quits out, out of the game, should I say, uh, because he knows that uh, his opponent will be able to finish him. Look, there's only four supply uh, for him, and that's one Oracle and a Probe here. That did not look well for him. So that was game number one. Hello there, Revangale, welcome back. Hello there, Wardy. How you doing, man? How's your exams? Okay, game number two coming up right now. Game number two is going to be... a ZVZ. ZVZs are very interesting at the start. I am on uh, the EU server, yes. Alright, so the next game, as I said, is going to be a ZVZ. Unfortunately, it is the same map. Looks like Belshir Vestige is quite uh, uh, quite a popular map, quite a nice map to play on. So, in the bottom right, we do have a Jerk. Or su should I say a Barcode, but, you know, <laughs> I just hate Barcodes. Sorry about that. Sorry about that. I didn't mean to offend you, but I just hate Barcodes. I think it's redundant. Uh, unless you are a professional player. In the top we will have MY3D MIU opposing uh, the barcode and uh, hmm okay so probably these two guys uh, actually do know each other uh, judging by the looks of things and I have to say that both of these uh, have been ranked to diamond uh, currently in this replay but I think I think the season previous they were masters I'm not uh, I'm not actually sure. Has the Oblay... Oh, okay, it did switch. Okay, so... Uh, yep. ZVZ, you know, we can see just by the supplies that there are no temples uh, and no uh, similar shenanigans going down. Uh, no very early aggressions. Now we have the pool going down for Miyu right on 15. Uh, so he's going to be opening with a pool, probably into a hatch and then into a gas. We shall have to see. His opponent most probably is going to go for a 15 hatch. But uh, he already should have had the drone down there. I don't know what's he... I think he's busy typing, actually. <laughs> Not enough APM. We require faster fingers. Oh, okay, so he's getting a pool, but uh, quite later than his opponent. His opponent is 40 seconds or 30 seconds up. Uh, in this regard, uh, compared to his opponent, and now the hatch goes down, gas goes down for Miyu, so uh, uh, he's already beginning to mine that. I wouldn't be surprised if uh, we saw gas is going down for the barcode player uh, as well. Uh, so far, it's not happening though. So, yeah, both players having their expansions up, and both players, I think, yep, 
both players scouting that they are expanding and uh, well usually if you if you look at ZVZ these days you know I have said it a number of times it's all about getting a spire up the fastest you can without putting yourself in danger and you know, if, if you can get uh, a, a leg up on the mutilus count very early on in the game compared to your opponent, then you pretty much have the game in the back unless you take very bad exchanges, uh, very bad engagements. Uh, if that's the case, then... You know, oh my god, look at this Gosu timing! I love it. Queen getting down right when the hatch finishes. I always love these moments. So, uh, speed getting researched. For Miu, and uh, speed will begin to be researched as well for the barcodes player. Is he actually? Yeah, he is continuing to mine gas. Both players actually are, but uh, I'll have to give the edge to Miu here because he's way ahead on uh, the gas. Uh, he started mining that way, 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 way earlier than his opponent. Uh, there we have the bending that's going down. Meanwhile. Barcode is getting a uh, spine crawler. He does not want to be getting a baneling nest just yet, and uh, he knows the threat of banelings should be on the horizon any second or any minute here. So he is getting that spine crawler just to help him defend. I can't say I'm a really big fan of this uh, because this is quite a quite a large choke, and uh, you would need a partial or a full wall off. Uh, if you want to be defending versus banelings with spine crawlers, you would have to uh, have queens and spines and wall off there. Uh, so we're now getting the banelings nest finally. Uh, Miu does a scout uh, that the spine crawler is there, so probably judging. Hey, my opponent is playing defensively, so uh, there is no need for Miu to attack. And in fact, he is already getting a lair, and oh my goodness, this is a really freakishly fast lair. 5 minute 50 second lair, when do you ever see that? No aggression uh, as a result of this, no aggression should be coming out of Miyu. The question is, does his opponent scout it? No, he doesn't. He, doesn't, he hasn't sent any links forwards to his base, he doesn't know anything. And, uh, you know, this is going to cause him some problems, because if uh, Mew has enough gas to start a spire straight away when that lair is finished, let's see. He does have the resources almost, 150, come on, and a spire, there we go, spire going down. Not as quickly as it could have, but uh, we also have a third base on the way, of which the barcode player knows. Now, will this trigger a reaction? Four zerglings in production, how much larva do we have? Nine more larva, but no additional zerglings being produced. Uh, and uh, he's not... Oh, there we go. As I say that, ten more zerglings in production. They are all, all rallied towards the third base, but we have two defensive bandings. If those bandings get good detonations off, Miu will be in a very good position. And the barcode player, we see that he's being really, really careful. He does have two bandings of his own, though. And, uh, well, he... It's it's all about the micro right now. He has to make a very good exchange. Let us see if he will be capable of doing that. Miu has to be really careful not to lose his banelings needlessly. Oh, that was a very good trade. Two banelings for nothing. Uh, and uh, now the barcode has to pull back. He is taking his third base as well. And I like this idea of pooping creep here and getting a spine crawler over there. Even before you get that base up. Uh, that will that will help you defend that base uh, and m you know make it more likely that it will finish. Uh, but uh, against overwhelming numbers of zerglings, it doesn't really work that way. So uh, we have uh, flyer carapace level one going down right now for a Mew. We have mutalisks already in production. He will be up by two mutalisk production cycles compared to his opponent as Barco tries to deny his expansion over here and he has to get it but nice detonations from uh, from me who actually oh that was a missed opportunity he could have killed so many zerglings there goes a detonation helping his own zerglings defend but it it is not enough but now with the emergence of the mutalisks uh, well actually if I think about it I I'm not sure that the barcode player had to have pulled back out of that uh, out of out of that attack, I think you know the hatchery is pretty low on health. I think it would be worth it to finish off that hatchery because w 
seeing those mutalisks, he had to realize that, oh crap, I'm behind on the mutalisks. My timing is way too late, so better kill that hatch, so I limit his uh, larva. Uh, as it is, even like if we look at the minerals, they're what? They're not being mined. Uh, he's only focusing on gathering enough gas and he's got a quite he's got quite a stockpile if we look at the mutilus count it's 13 versus 11 so not a big difference but he's got a uh, upgrade lead as well and more mutilus on the way if uh, you are going to be watching the production tab from this point on forward you will notice that both of these players will be producing mutilisks mutilisks whenever they have gas um, so once that carapace upgrade finishes, of course, Mew will have an advantage in every single uh, air fight. And we could have one here right now. Uh, those mules uh, were a little bit clumped up, though, and despite having the upgrade advantage actually already getting attacks level 1, uh, he decides not to take the engagement. Uh, he wasn't too confident there going into that fight. Maybe he thought that uh, he will not be able to win it. So, pulling back, and uh, he's just uh, comfortable with uh, having his bases up, with having his uh, two mineral lines saturated, uh, squeezing in drones whenever he can, and uh, harassing with his mutalisks, uh, keeping his enemy at home, but uh, not being successful in that. And uh, as the mutalisks approach the third base, he's already pulling back his uh, own mutalisks, and now the base will go down. Okay, so now I understand Barco's player going for the 100% certainty. Here he's going for guaranteed damage uh, and uh, wanted to make sure that that base will go down, but oh my god, Spire under attack by the mutas. This is not good news for the barcode, and this w this will probably mean game in the long run, because right now Miu can continue producing mutalisks while his opponent can't. There are no spore crawlers for the red player. For the Zerg we have ample amounts of spore crawlers. This is a really good read here, because by sniping the opponent's Spire, you may 99% of the time you force him into s into a move such as this, which is a base trade, because he has to do enough damage because uh, uh, he has to do enough damage before uh, you can get too big of a mutilisk lead over him, and this is exactly what is happening right now. The third base already has fallen to uh, two links. This base will fall down to mutas, and uh, well. There is no lair for the red player. The lair has been killed right here by the Mulisks. They are going to kill uh, the third expansion as well. And with with all these spore colors and the links, how many mutas do we have here? I, you know what? I really think he could have taken this on. I really think by approaching from an angle, he could have killed all of those spores and possibly tried to snipe the lair or even the spire and even this uh, late game base race. A little bit more but as it is he's at a very big disadvantage he does not have any mutalisk uh, production for himself in fact all the production facilities apart from the pool have uh, gone down and uh, well his opponent if he wasn't supply blocked he could still crank out three more mutas in a in a moment here but he's getting supply blocked severely now this main base this is as this is as much defense as he, as he can get at this stage in game. Oh, and he finds the hatch, kills it quickly with the mutalisks, and this is the last chance for the Zerk player with red colors. He has to go in and he has to kill him right now. He does have quite a lot of mutalisks, but a little bit of a missed micro pulling away from his opponent when he should have been attacking, and now they're up in each other's faces, and I think Miu is winning the air battle quite decisively, and the ground battle as well, to which the Barcode player uh, replies with a rage quit. So this is also one way of playing ZVZs, just snipe the opponent's spire, and then turtle up. So, that was game number two. Thanks for everybody watching, by the way. Uh, Tailsick, welcome to the stream. I hope you enjoy your stay here. So once again, this is Cast My Game, where me, a wannabe caster, is casting your replays that you submit. If you have a Master versus Master 
1v1 replay approximately 20 minutes long, send it to me to my email address below my camera window that's right there, belnoir at cesnam.cz with the title cast my game and please do include a short description, most notably and most important things you have to not forget are your name, please indicate which of the players is you. Um, then uh, a short description of what roughly transpired in the game so that I don't have to watch all the replays but just you know try to go for like search in my mail client uh, rush and then I I know every single replay that included a rush and I can just check those uh, and pick from those so um, yeah uh, usually I cast four games uh, and I do this four days a week Monday Tuesday Thursday and Friday. Oh, by the way, a little bit of a news. Friday's show this week is cancelled because I have to leave straight after work, which means I will not be able to come back home to cast. So, Friday's show this week will be cancelled. But don't worry, I'll be back on Monday. Uh, let's look at game number three here. It is going to be Headhunter versus Mech, a PVT on Neo Planet S. And, uh, well, uh, just a little bit of a heads up, both of these guys are from the Czech Republic and uh, Headhunter is quite the celebrity on the, on the Czech scene. He's one of the better known players and he is spawning in grubby colors, which are green, here in the bottom left on Neo Planet S. His opponent is going to be Mac the Red Terran, here in the top right. Now, as I said, Headhunter, one of the better known players, he was on Team Alien Invasion. Maybe he still is, I am not quite sure, as he's been inactive uh, for the past, uh, I don't know, six months or so. Um, he practically just stopped playing and uh, transitioned from StarCraft into Heroes of Might and Magic 3. Yes. Yes, you heard correctly. I do not know if he's still playing the game, but uh, recently he came back to StarCraft and started playing again, started practicing again. He also has a stream, uh, the link to which is really complicated. Matsor, I see you there in the chat, so if you have a link to Headhunter's stream and would be so kind and post it into the chat, I would be very grateful because it's it, it has some letters in there and some numbers and stuff. And uh, that's too complicated for me, so uh, if you would be so kind. Uh, so, of course, Headhunter, a top master of a player, a uh, very good player actually, and his videos are quite educational if you are a master level player and want to improve upon your play even more. Uh, probably will not be as helpful to diamonds, platinums, and such, but uh, very, very helpful to master level players. And there we go. There we have the links. So check him out, guys. He's a, a really cool person, uh, although sometimes he rages quite a lot. But, uh, you know, who doesn't? Who doesn't? I know I have raged uh, a fair amount myself, so... Okay. So a gas opening by Mech. Uh, he is getting a Marine first. I'm wondering if he will follow this up with a Reaper or not. And probably that's exactly what that probe is looking for. Uh, looking for if the second gas will be taken as well, or if the if a marine or if a reaper comes out. And you know, Mac not having his wall off finished uh, will make it a little bit easier for Headhunter to scout, but he's not opting to go with that probe in, uh, does not want to sacrifice it. Instead, he's going to hide it somewhere here and re-scout later on. Meanwhile, we see Mac scouting his opponent as well, and he's moving into a factory, so uh, you know, possibilities off of this, of course, are very many. We shall have to wait and see what kind of follow-up he does have to this. And Headhunter with a really, really, really greedy expansion, getting a Nexus before even getting any units. And he is going to be defending the Nexus with a Mothership Core. And, uh, okay, so he's getting a gateway, after, uh, gateway tech after that. And uh, then he will be getting a Stalker. Uh, this is smart play, uh, I have to say, but it is very, very, very greedy. If he misplays this, he can be in a lot of trouble. Uh, we have a reactor uh, finishing up, and alrighty, a factory going down. So we know what this is, guys. This is going to be Hellbats. Uh, but uh, first, Mech is going to have... Uh, 
Mac is going to go produce a couple of Widow Mines. Uh, he should not be afraid of any Stargate openers, to be quite frank, because he did not see a second gas being taken on the Protoss side of things. The first Stalker only just now popping out as the expansion Nexus finishes. Second gas being taken by Headhunter, his Mothership Core already approaching the main base. Now Mothership Core can kill one Marine without any problems, only losing shields. Two Marines, that's a little bit too much, and of course Widow Mines? Now, I can see those, and, uh, you know, if a Widow Mine ex explodes on a Mothership Core with this much health, then it's only a couple of uh, Marine shots away from dying. So, Headhunter pre preserving that Mothership Core, he's getting a robotic facility, which is really smart, because he did see those Widow Mines, and uh, he wants to stay safe versus a Widow Mine drop. He is going to re-scout the natural uh, expansion of his opponent, and he sees that there is no natural there. I want to s I I want to see no he has not seen the factory so probably has absolutely zero idea what is coming his way he did see the starboard though uh, the usual, and now he sees the armory, okay, now he sees the armory, he uses a time warp on the SCV, slowing them down, he, I think he even saw those hellbats, and four hellbats, they can kill quite a lot of probes. Now Headhunter, he played really, really greedily, he only has one gate, he's got no forge for cannons. Two additional gates uh, are going to finish right now, and he has to warp in a lot of stalkers. Instead, he's taking a gas, well, this is really a ballsy move. He's either really brave or really confident in his ability to hold anything that may be thrown out his way. So let's see what does he end up warping in. Two Stokers are coming in right now. Uh, first Medivac will be out very very shortly. Oh, and Mac trying to go Mac. I really like this idea. Uh, not a lot of Terrans are going Mac versus their opponents. So it's always nice to see them try. And now, you know, this is this move by the Terran, basically, what, what has the Protoss seen? Uh, he did not see any expansion, so this is going to be a very heavy one base pressure. Headhunter already knows what kind of pressure it will be. Now, let's see if Mech will split up his uh, Medivax or not. Headhunter is getting even more gateways as the medevacs are going in and they are unloading all four hellbats at once. There are only three stalkers here. Some of them ha have been nearby the natural base to uh, protect that one. And well, it, at least one of those should go down. Oh my goodness! All of those two medevacs survive. Still three hellbats here. Let's look at the probe kill count. 16 probes going down and I just want to say one thing. Uh, stacking up your probes on an assimilator versus hellbats not a good idea. <laughs> uh, that may work wor versus zerglings, but it's not a good idea versus hellbats. And behind this mech is getting his expansion, very late expansion. If we look at his SCV count, uh, the game is really quite even still. It's 29 SCVs to 29 probes. Now, you know, if you go for a one base opening, a very heavy one base opening as a turn like this, you pretty much have to do damage because if your opponent is going for a fast expansion, you need to do economic damage to even out the game. If you can't manage that, you will be hopelessly behind. And, uh, well, here we have some Widow Mine defense. Nice idea, bringing the Immortal, and uh, Headhunter, I think he's... I think he's under the impression that he has to do damage, which I'm not entirely sure... I'm not entirely sure he will be able to, nor that he actually needs. I, d I don't actually think that he needs to do the damage right, ne uh, right here. What I think he needs to do is tech up a little bit and take his third base, because it's not like the Terran can kill him anytime soon. Hellbats are good, but you can see that uh, Mac is assuming a defensive posture, so in my opinion, lingering here any longer uh, as a Protoss in this situation would not accomplish too much. Maybe, maybe you know, uh, getting a soft contain on your opponent, opponent uh, forcing him to keep all of his Hellbats back home instead of uh, loading them up into a, another medevac and trying to drop you again, which is the last thing you want to be happening. But it is going to happen anyways. 
And this is why I said that, you know, it's better to defend versus those drops than uh, doing pressure like this. Of course you can defend in a variety of ways. We still have the Mothership Core here, and it does have energy for an Axis Cannon. We have a Robotic Bay on the way, we have a Forge on the way. Uh, no Blink, nor, uh, nor Charge being researched, and nor Templar Archives. So I'm a little bit confused by the choice of Headhunter's tech here at all. Oh, this is a really bad move by Headhunter getting into the siege range of that siege tank. And he's losing quite a lot here. That was definitely not a favorable trade for him. Meanwhile, the drop unloads in the natural of the Protoss. Four Stalkers being warped in. And what does Mac do? Well, he loads up and is boosting away right away. But the medevac gets shut down. So Headhunter being a little bit lucky there. It was very, very close to being out of range, and it could have killed more probes in the main base. 22 probes going down in this game so far, putting Mech a little bit ahead. Actually, well, quite a bit ahead. 45 SCVs, uh, count in the mules, and you have a situation here. So, I'm a little bit confused for Headhunter, because he did get the Twilight Council quite a while ago, and then decided instead to go into Twilight Council tech, getting DTs or Templars or any of the sort, he decided to throw down a Robo Bay and a Forge. And he still doesn't have a third base, and he's trying to transition into a completely different army composition than what he initially started out with. Um, I don't know what was behind this decision, I would have to ask him, but I would be really curious uh, what... Uh, what was the cause for him to decide going uh, Colossi suddenly? Because, I mean, Colossi are good against one thing, and one thing only, in my opinion, and that's Marines. I know I'm not, like, anywhere near his, uh, his level of play, but Hellbats, quite beefy. Tanks, well, Colossi are not outranging them, so... I think Storms would have been a little bit better, and of course, Storms can hit Widow Mines even if uh, they are not seen. And as we can see, Mac is pushing out, and he's pulling quite a lot of SCVs with him, so this is a very, very strong two-base all-in. How many SCVs is he leaving back home, actually? I, I want to see. So approximately 30, 32 SCVs, maybe, staying back home, which means that he has almost tw 20 with him. Yeah, it's 17 SCVs here. And uh, this army for Headhunter is not quite as big as he would have uh, wanted uh, it to be. Widowmine's burrowing here, forcing Headhunter to retreat. That was a very nice reaction by him, but he does have vision over them. He does have an observer here. Uh, meanwhile, a drop in the main base causes Headhunter to lose even more probes, and this will cut into his uh, income quite greatly. He does have a third base uh, up, but uh, he doesn't have any army and quite a large bank. Uh, getting a another Colossus, but look how fast this army is falling. Siege tanks, there are five of them here, and they're pretty strong when they're sieged up, of course. Headhunter taking blow after blow after blow. And, uh, well, nice arc here for Headhunter, but he has to be careful not to lose his Colossi, and this is not a good position, he has to pull back. Photon Overcharge activated. Nice force wheels, though, I have to say, cutting off quite a sizable portion of that army. But what he really needs to get rid of are those tanks, and this is a really difficult position to engage from, because you are engaging into a choke. And that's never going to work well. Meanwhile, Mech is taking out this pylon here, uh, sending even more reinforcements to reinforce this. Uh, let's see how mu how many harvesters Headhunter has. He does have quite enough, 51. But oh my goodness, his army is just disappearing. At least the gas expansive units. He's waiting for his opponent to unsiege so that he can catch him off guard. Those stalkers do have blink, so they can blink down from this cliff and get a flank behind the Terran army. But as it is. Well, the moment's passed. We have another group attacking the third base. Headhunter trying to save as many probes as possible, but if he would would have blanked those stalkers here right now, they would have uh, gotten caught off guard by this army here in the south. And here we go. Headhunter feeling that uh, this is uh, the right time to engage as his nexus is getting perilously close to being uh, destroyed. Leading with the immortals. Will he be able to take out these siege tanks? He needs to... He needs to take those out, but no, he will not be able to do so. And those zealots even dying before they get to 
uh, the reinforcements without charge, it's a little bit difficult to cross that gap, cross that battlefield, and Mech taking out both his third base and his expansion and headhunter not doing really well in this game. And that is to say, Mac did not even have uh, medevacs to heal his hellbats. And still, this push was so, so, so powerful. Uh, I don't know exactly what happened there. Maybe Headhunter missed a couple of production cycles because it really, really felt to me that. Uh, I really thought that his army was ridiculously small by the time Mech moved out. And of course, taking a very bad trade here, move commanding or. or or you know, placing his units directly underneath the siege tanks, uh, getting shelled by them. That was a very bad engagement to take, uh, putting him behind. So uh, yeah, Mac taking this game. He's been trying to play uh, mechanical Terran quite a lot lately. So this time it uh, did work out for him quite well. Um, I would really love to have asked Headhunter what was the idea behind suddenly going Colossi. Because from a logical standpoint, you already have the Twilight Council. Why not just go Storm Archon charge lots or, or Blink Stalkers or something like that? It would have been, you know, he would have had that uh, those, those units out way quicker than those Colossi in my opinion. I don't know. It just has more utility. Alright, so that was game number three. Hello, Rasta Doofy. Hello there. How are you doing? <coughs> and as I take... As I take a sip of my delicious strawberry tea, even though I'm not British, I'm quite good. I'm quite good. So I hope you guys have enjoyed that game. I will give my vocal cords a little bit of a rest. And uh, then I will move on into uh, game number four. <coughs> Alrighty. Um, no, I am not streaming on Friday, but that's only this week because I will not be here this Friday. So, official announcement: Friday show will be cancelled. And of course, as you can see in the uh, top right corner of your screen right now, there is a news post: Followers Tournament Number Eight moved to May 18th. So yeah, we shall have another followers tournament. Just to recap, it's a 16 player best of 3 single elimination bracket with best of 5 finals and best of 3 third place match. Pri total prize pool $100, 32 for first place, 16 to for uh, 16 for second place, 8 for third place and $4 per capita to all the rest of the bracket. If you want to participate all you have to do is follow my stream or follow my Twitter as this is followers tournament so only followers will be admitted and uh, you know by following my Twitter you will also not miss the announcement and the sign up link that will be released before I leave this town for three days so let's go into the final game the final game is going to be a TVZ as you can see, I'm trying to maintain a, a diverse um, 
programming here so that we get a little bit of every matchup. Oh, I'll be visiting my grandmother. I want to build another greenhouse and uh, I need to build a new door for the garage. So I'll be putting together a heavy oak, uh, oak door complete with uh, handles and everything. All right, let me let me just check if the overlay has switched. Yes, it has. We are in game, and this is Whirlwind. The biggest map we'll be casting on uh, this time around. And uh, in the top right, we do have uh, the Red Terran Lubix. In the top left, it is going to be his opponent, Windhale. I'm not entirely sure who submitted this replay because I tried to search in my email box uh, for the names of these two players but the search turned out absolutely nothing. As I said, please guys, if you do send me replays, if you do submit replays, indicate in the body of the email th your player name. That makes it really, really that much easier uh, to search for your names and do proper shout outs and uh, give the viewers information about you so if uh, Lubix or Windhale if you're watching this please next time you send a replay if you decide to send one uh, indicate which one of these guys is you don't just send a Dropbox link and say in this game I do this and this because I don't know which one of the, those players is you <laughs> so it's better to actually send the replay in the email itself. It's way better. Okay, so uh, command center first opening for Terran. Uh, this is quite common on this map, I have to say. Uh, just because, you know, the Zergs always, pretty much always go for 15 hatches. Getting command center first on this map is quite beneficial to you because uh, it means that you will not fall behind in Econ in the early game and it sets you up for a very, very, very strong mid game uh, with uh, potential 3 base all ins or very heavy 3 base attacks with 2-2. Uh, of course, the problem is securing the third base on this map. Both thirds have two avenues of, of approach here and here, and the other third you can approach from here and from here. Now, of course, if you have siege tanks or widow mines in this area, this base is uh, secured at least from one location and then you can wall off here with supply depots slash barracks. Looks like Lubix has found his opponent. Windhail, not very much so, uh, just yet. And, uh, well, we have already 100 gas uh, mined, so speed started straight away. Which tells me, you know, for those who are interested, this gas went down before the pool. Uh, that's the only way, pretty much, you can have 100 gas straight up when the uh, when, when the pool finishes. So we see our Terran ter player getting a barracks after this. He's getting a gas, mining happily from it. And, uh, well, uh, is he going to be... No, he's not going to be getting an add-on, which means he's probably going to be getting a factory. And... Uh, after he gets a couple of marines, uh, he will wants to build a bunker here or a couple of barracks or something to wall that off, just to stay safe. Meanwhile, no additional attack going down for uh, Windhale. And has he actually... No, he has not scouted yet. He, he has not scouted anything. Lubix is keeping an eye out for a third base. Now, you know, if Windhale scouted a command center first, he might... He might have reacted with going uh, for a very, very, very quick third hatch. But that did not happen because he's playing really, really greedy. Notice that he has not drone scouted. He just wants to find where his opponent is just with his overlord. His third base is going to be denied for a moderate amount of time. But uh, the six links should have no trouble taking care of this. Will they actually end up cancelling that in time? No, he did not. So that's a uh, hundred and fifty minerals lost for the Terran player straight up. These six links, of course, uh, they're just purely defensive ones. Uh, they, I, I wouldn't mind him scouting. I wouldn't mind him poking the front. He already knows by this time uh, where his opponent is because this old lord has not seen anything down there. So he should know by this time where his opponent is. And of course, uh, Windhale, he is getting a third command center additional gas as he's getting or should be getting Hellions. 
there we go, two Hellions already out. Wall off is complete, so these links will not do all that much. One being sent uh, to the Watchtower, very nice idea always. Another one will be keeping an eye on the third base, and another one will be keeping an eye on what's moving out from the turn's base. Very nice positional play here uh, by Windhale. Simpac just now started uh, for the turn player, so everything is looking pretty, pretty standard. Now the only thing I want to know is will he follow this up with double engineering bay or will he follow this up with multiple barracks? This is the main question you want to ask yourself when uh, you are seeing a turn play versus a zerg and doing this kind of build and it is going to be double ng base so uh, he definitely wants to set up for a very strong mid game he won't be doing uh, two base assaults meanwhile on the zerg's side of things in camp creep we have uh, double upgrades on the way as well but they are a little bit ahead of the turn ones we have bailing nest going down and layer halfway done so uh, what can be expected of course here just judging by the upgrades will be the good old-fashioned reliable Ling Baneling Mutilus composition from the Zerg nice job by the turn player here, Lubix, uh, microing very, very well against those Zerglings, uh, causing maximum damage possible to them. <coughs> and uh, let's see the units lost 14 versus 3. So we killed quite a lot of Zerglings. We have Spire going down. Double ups rolling for the turn. Additional barracks is being added on. Quite a lot of them, to be uh, to be quite frank. So we will have five barracks total. We also have a starport on the way, and uh, all these Hellions are still providing to be a still proving to be a nuisance for the Zerg player, and they actually will kill off all of these Zerglings yet again. This is just a very, very good play by Lubix. Very solid play. Are the scans going to go down? Is he going to clean up some of this, uh, some of these creep tumors? He might as well. He's got quite a lot of Hellions. There we go, scanning the creep. And uh, look at this. The Zerg player producing nothing but Zerglings. The Harvester counts are quite even, which means the Terran player is a little bit ahead, uh, thanks to Mules, or should be. There we go, just slightly ahead at times, not by very much. Of course, uh, the Zerg player does have three mining bases, not two, so he's got a little bit of a more of an income compared to the Terran player, just because he's uh, got his harvesters spread out a little bit more. Plus one, plus one is nearing completion. Factory going down a little bit later than uh, ideally Lubix would have wanted. He still has those Hellions providing map control, but as the first Mutas will be coming out, has he actually scanned his opponent's base? That's what I'm interested in. Just now he's scanning. Oh my goodness. By the way, guys, I have not seen this replay. This is just me being awesome. Thank you very much. So he does see the Spire. He has to put up missile turrets immediately, and he does. He's adding quite a lot of reactors so he will have a substantial amount of marines uh, out very very quickly and he will be able to defend versus mutalisks quite handily he even has the opportunity in a couple of seconds to start producing thors if he so wished of course nowadays you don't really you don't really see thors on the field that much so uh, the first missile turret takes a couple of shots at those mutalisks and oh my god Green hail, you have to be really careful. Miss micro in your mutas is not the way to go, but actually this is really smart. He got past the missile turret blockade, and now he's in the main base and it can cause some damage, but he's being chased away by these marines. They do have stim, they do have plus one, plus one finished, so they are pretty darn effective versus those mutalisks. Now the question is, is Windhell going to be building more mutas, or is he going to transition out of this? Plus two, plus two, halfway done. Terran's upgrades not really being queued up quite as fast as they, as they should have been. Uh, plus two attack only just now being queued up. Plus two armor nowhere to be seen. That's definitely a mistake by Lubix. Definitely should have had that armory up uh, sooner and uh, queue those upgrades up way faster. And well, we do indeed see that Winhel will not be getting more mutas. In fact, he is getting an uh, infestation pit and most probably will be trying to transition into hive tech as quickly as possible. He also has fourth base on the way. So now the roles are reversed. Lubix is taking the center map control. 
and uh, it doesn't look like Winhell wants to be aggressive versus his, uh, versus his opponent. He knows the third base is not here, but to his to his uh, very uh, detriment, it is here. But he does know about it. I'm wondering why is he not trying to go around like this, you know, and try to assault the base, avoiding the central watchtower. I'm really wondering why he's not doing that. Meanwhile, we do have an attack uh, from Lubix, but he has to stim back. That was a little bit of a premature stim. He's going to need that stim to spread versus the Banelings as he's trying to get to the safety of the Widow Mines. Will those get good hits? No, they don't. They detonated on all the wrong units, and the Banelings are slowly but surely taking this infantry apart. And, well, actually, Lubix helping quite a lot. Uh, in uh, killing his own units uh, because he stimmed three two or three times completely needlessly and this army is all in the red there are no mutalisks uh, I mean no medevacs they have all been killed by the mutas so a very good situation there for Winhale he actually killed quite a lot of units without having to use banelings to do it because his opponent granted him free hits by overstimming three times beautiful play beautiful play Terran player very nice. Don't do it next time. Thank you. Will not make me sad. But uh, yeah, both players are getting pretty high in the food counts. And we have Pneumatized Care Pace on the way. Plus two Flyer Attacks and an Ultraless Cavern. And as I have said so many times, as soon as you get Hive, please queue up Adrenal Glands. Don't be lazy. Adrenal Glands are such a crucial upgrade for the Zerg players. Such a crucial upgrade. And what I like uh, about Lubix's play right here is uh, the positioning of the Widow Mines. He can retreat along the path of those Widow Mines quite efficiently, uh, using them to take out Mutas, take out Bainings, and let's see if they actually will... Oh, they... Oh, huge hits going down onto those Mutas, damaging quite a lot of them. And, uh, well, not actually killing uh, all of those Bainings. That was really unfortunate. Uh, for uh, Lubix and quite fortunate for Winhale because that was uh, that could have been a very terrible engagement for Winhale but as it is it wasn't as terrible at all um, he did see I think he, yeah he definitely did see this drop Widow Mines is still helping uh, Lubix secure the center as he is preparing to assault the third base, is Winhel pull, pulling any units there? It, it looks like he is giving up the center position. Oh my goodness, and always moving through the minefield. That is not a thing you want to be doing. Uh, fifth base for uh, Winhel just now finished, uh, but the fourth is under attack. Let's see how good is Winhel in his defense. Meanwhile, Lubix is thinking of attacking a second way as well. I don't know why he hasn't, to be quite honest, because uh, all the Mutalisks have been pulled one way. He could have made a poke up here, get rid of some of that creep, snipe some banelings, you know, force something to happen. As it is, he's a little bit out of position, but more and more reinforcements are streaming in. Did he see the... Uh, now he knows there are Ultras on the field. Okay, so what he should do is switch into Marauder production immediately, as fast as he can, because those Marines, they are not going to cut it for a... For a for a very uh, long while from this point but he's only he, he's not even getting any more orders all his barracks only have reactor upgrades now this can work but you would have to have a lot more barracks there's a lot of queuing on uh, queuing up uh, going on uh, inside those barracks as you can see so not really the best macro but when you have such a bank, it doesn't really matter, and Lubix is maxed out, don't forget. He is getting an additional base. Uh, what he's hugely behind in, though, is upgrades. The Zerg will have three, three finished in a matter of seconds, and his infantry still is only on 2-2, and will be for the next two minutes or so. He will have plus three attack, but if he takes a bad engagement, I mean, he will have to have numbers on his side. Nice positioning on the Widow Mines, getting taken uh, care of all the Zerglings, but right now he has to load up that third base, unfortunately will survive, and still a couple of Mutalisks here, uh, very smartly produced by Winhill, just to control the amount of medevacs and trying to chase them down, and he will, the boosters are on cooldown, so, you know, not very many medevacs uh, for Lubix here, having only one starport producing them, two at a time granted, but 
not enough medibags, I feel like. And his army is getting smaller and smaller and smaller each time he takes an engagement. Those widow mines are getting some decent hits off, but uh, well, it's it's pretty close. And now he's running away across those widow mines. He's trying to lead that army into the widow mine field. There are no observers here, so those hits will land on the ultras and the bandings. There are very few bandings and lanes remaining, but there. We still have six Ultralisks, and those Marines are so low on health, they have to hold this position no matter what. But with that much, uh, with the army being that much damaged, versus six Ultralisks, and holy crap, 20 Banelings. Do you really think the Terran army might be able to hold? I don't know, it's gonna require some very, very good positioning, and blocking and stuff like that. Meanwhile, the turn player has succeeded in taking out both of these bases with a single drop. That's good for him. If he can hold this attack, he may just pull ahead in the battle, but oh my goodness, a big bailing bus going through his ramp, annihilating every single Marine, not splitting fast enough, and still there are Ultralisks remaining, forcing Lubix to GG out of the game. Okay, so that was the fourth and last game of today. If you guys enjoyed, please do tune in tomorrow as well. Bring your friends as well. The more people, the merrier, of course. If you have a 1v1 Master versus Master level replay, approximately 20 minutes long, send it to me to belnoir at cesnam.cz, the email address you see below my camera window. And uh, I might pick it, I might cast it, if I do, I'll let you know, but please include your player name in the body of the email and a short description of what roughly transpired. Use keywords like Hellbat drops, Widow Mine play, Rush. Incorporate that into your sentences, please, because that makes my life a uh, hell of a lot easier when uh, I am browsing through the replays and trying to pick uh, the better ones to cast. I will be... Oh, actually, I will not be having the show tomorrow, because tomorrow is Wednesday, and on Wednesdays I'm casting for the SCB Rush at twitch.tv forward slash SCB Rush 1. It is a gold platinum tournament. If you want to compete, go to www.scvrush.com, find the tournament in question, make an account, sign up. I'll be casting together with Greedy Farmer, so thank you very much for tuning in and uh, I will figure out how to mute my Facebook next time promise I have not found out how to do that yet sorry I have my chat muted but for some reason whenever there is a notification it makes a beep sound so I'll have to I'll have to play around with that a little bit sometimes Facebook's and other social networks can be quite annoying uh, VOD from yesterday's episode will be up straight after I finish uh, the cast on my YouTube. So check that out. YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, everything is just slash Bill Noir TV. See you guys next time. And until we do, good luck, have fun, and remember to storm first and ask questions later. See ya.